Hi there, everyone, and thanks for being here. My name is Sally Guy. I'm the Director of Policy here at the Canadian Association of Social Workers. I'm your moderator today, so that means I'll be asking your questions, the audience's questions, of the presenters at the end of the formal part of the presentation, which will be about 45-50 minutes. That said, this webinar is a collaboration with the Manitoba College of Social Workers, and we're especially happy to be offering this presentation as CSW was instrumental in having social work named and included in the legislation that brought about MAID, which is a huge win for our profession. And so it feels appropriately full circle to now be exploring the, uh, the clinical reality of MAID. Before introducing our speakers, I just wanted to note that all the formalities, so how to access uh, the recording, how to download the slide deck, how to get your certificate of attendance, all those details are written down in the welcome widget that popped up when you logged on. So if you don't see that widget, just click on the loudspeaker icon at the bottom of your window. So with that said, it's my honor to introduce our speakers. If you're from Manitoba, you're likely going to recognize our, our presenters from the news. Their specialized unit and the great work they've been doing has been the subject of at least a couple of pieces at this point. So I'm going to give them each quick introductions, but you can read their full bios on the right hand of your screen uh, beside their pictures. So first up, Jill Taylor Brown has been an oncology social worker for over 36 years. Throughout her career, she's provided counseling on grief and loss. She's developed and facilitated support groups, including one for 20 years on, uh, for women living with cancer. Jill joined the MAID team in December 2016. Megan McLeod has worked for more than 30 years in clinical and leadership positions in healthcare and sits on the Manitoba MAID Advisory Council, uh, Panel. She now works with the provincial MAID clinical team as a psychosocial specialist. So Megan won't be providing part of the formal presentation, so you may not hear from her until the end, but she's here to add her expertise to our question and answer period. Finally, we have Fred Nelson, who also has more than 35 years of experience in palliative care as a clinician, a consultant, and a teacher. He's published articles, he's delivered keynote addresses, and he's active on a number of committees and boards across the whole country. Uh, and so Fred is also a psychosocial specialist with the MAID team. So I think it's clear that we are in expert hands today, and it is my pleasure to pass the microphone over to Jill. Thank you very much, Sally, for that kind introduction. Um, uh, we really want to thank the Canadian Association of Social Work and our own local college, the Manitoba College of Social Workers, to invite us to give this presentation. It's, uh, we're really excited about it, really looking forward to telling you about uh, the MAID legislation, how MAID works in a little bit in Canada, how it works in Manitoba. Um, I'm going to start by giving an overview of what we call the five W's of MAID, the who, what, where, when, and how. I want to take this moment to acknowledge our medical director, Dr. Kim Weeb, because we basically, um, I don't know what the word is, but we've kind of taken her slides and are speaking from them for this per first part of the presentation. Um, and she is just a wonderful person to work with. and. Uh, I just want to acknowledge her and the work that she's done in her leadership in the province as well as our <coughs> other team members. So I will be talking about that. Then Fred is going to talk more specifically about the MAID approach in Manitoba and specifically the social work role and spend some time talking about the personal and professional impact of doing this work on ourselves. Okay. So. As most of you know, um, and we're, we're aware that many of you in the audience may know quite a bit about uh, MAID, Medical Assistance in Dying in Canada, uh, and are aware that it became legal in June of 2016. But we thought, because not all of you may be as well versed in it, that it would be important to just sort of set the context and, and give you some background around this. And I'm hoping that this first part is only going to take about 20, 25 minutes so that we can get to the parts that we know that you're probably even more interested in, which is what specifically we do as social workers on our team and what that's like for us. Um, and then we're really looking forward to some discussion with you and hoping to take lots of time for that. So there are two types of medical assistance in dying that have been legalized in Canada. One is called self-administered. You'll note that the language around all of this has changed over time. Uh, we've obviously, as you can see, moved away from assisted suicide, some of that um, 
language that is more problematic. And so self-administered medical assistance in dying is basically where the physician who, at least one physician who has approved the person uh, for a medically assisted death prescribes the medication and the patient self-administers that medication as an oral medication. The second type of medical assistance in dying is what's called clinician-assisted, where the physician who approves the request provides the prescription, provides the medication, and the medication is delivered by IV. At present, only the IV medication is what we are using in Manitoba and pretty well all across Canada. That is primarily because the medications that are used for a, a, the self-administered are not available in Canada. And what medications are available are seen by our physicians anyway as just not as good and not, um, not able to really do the job, to be frank. Um, oral self-administered medical assistance in dying is actually the only kind of maid that's available in the States. So when you think about places like Oregon and Washington, uh, that is self-administered. Um, so I think that's all. Do you guys want to add anything about that? Did I miss anything? Okay. <coughs> so who can provide MAID? So the federal law allows for physicians and nurse practitioners in Canada to provide MAID. Um, in Manitoba, it's only physicians for now who are doing it because in Manitoba, uh, nurse practitioners are not allowed to complete death certificates. And that's obviously part of the whole process. But we are aware that <coughs> nurse practitioners are providing medically assisted deaths in other parts of Canada. The legislation also covered all other healthcare providers and family and friends to participate in the process. So we're all covered with that legislation. We want to talk or have a slide for sure about conscience-based conscience objections. And basically that this is something that's been around prior to the legal legalization of a medically assisted death. But basically it's an objection to participate in a legally available medical treatment or procedure based on an own individual's personal values or beliefs. So there is no healthcare provider who is required to provide MAID. On the other hand, all healthcare providers have re professional responsibility to respond to a patient's request, to continue to um, provide non-MAID related medical care, so to ensure that there's non-abandonment of the, of the individual, and to ensure timely access to a resource <coughs> and information that will provide accurate information, as well as provide medical records. And, you know, we can spend more time talking about this uh, later in the questions and answers or in, in our discussion part, but this is a critical piece to know that even though uh, any individual can have a conscious objection, it is imperative that people get the information, they have a right to that information to know that this is legal and that this is possible. So where can MAID happen? Basically, MAID can happen um, anywhere that the patient wishes, um, so at home, or in hospital, or in a personal care home, or long-term facility. I'm sure that most of you have heard about uh, the issue, I guess I would call it, of faith-based facilities um, not uh, or having objections and therefore not allowing assessments or assisted deaths in their facilities. Um, here in Manitoba, some of those faith-based organizations do allow assessments, but they don't allow the actual assisted death. Um, others don't allow either. Uh, again, we know that this is something that's um, going on in other parts of Canada as well. So in Manitoba, the way we've dealt with that is that people who 
are eligible and are requesting an assisted death are actually moved from that faith-based <coughs> facility to uh, another dedicated place that has been arranged through our, our health authority. So when can an assisted death take place? Well, the law requires a minimum of 10 clear days from the time of a written request for an assisted death. Um, by written request, here in Manitoba, we have developed a special form that requires two signatures. Um, and I think there's more about this that I'll tell you about on later slides. Uh, but I, I know for myself, when I used to hear written requests, I thought, oh, well, someone could just kind of write down, I'd like this, pass a piece of paper to somebody, and that would be it. But there is actually specific forms and certain legal requirements around that written request that are, are very specific and very legal. Uh, our team, especially in the early days, and continually uh, work very closely with our, call them our legal, uh, legal advisors, I guess, yeah. <clears throat> so 10 clear days are, are actually uh, legal days. And so what happens is from the time the person signs that form, that counts as day zero, then you count 10 days, and then on the 11th day, the next day is the first time that someone could be eligible for an assisted death. Now that time can be shortened if the person is at imminent risk of death or of losing capacity to provide consent. Um, and we have shortened times a few times here in Manitoba for sure. The law requires that immediately before the actual procedure that the person is given plenty of opportunity to withdraw their request and that they provide consent and they need to have capacity to provide that consent. Now capacity is time and task specific, so it's not like they have to be able to uh, balance the checkbook or even necessarily know that today is February 15th. But they do need to understand what's going to happen to them and the consequences of that and that they will die and obviously not return from that. So I'm just going to do a quick overview now of the MAID process. And this is pretty much how it's happening in Canada, as far as we know, uh, before we go more specifically into what we're doing in Manitoba. Um, so someone will make an initial inquiry or request. So that request might come from the person themselves. It might come from a family member. It might come from a healthcare provider who, on behalf of the patient or the person, um, and that's usually how things begin, is that there's somehow a request. We are not putting pamphlets around, um, you know, and that's another thing we can talk about um, perhaps in the discussion section around, you know, how do people find out about this? How do we ensure that people know about their rights, but at the same time not in any way be seen to be promoting or encouraging in any way? So the request comes from them. Then there are two, and these are all the legal requirements now, that there are two independent assessments uh, by physician or nurse practitioner. There's certain eligibility criteria, which I'll tell you about in a minute. There's the written request that I've spoken about and the 10-day reflection period. So you can see that it's not an emergency service. It usually takes, the whole thing takes about two weeks. Again, sometimes that can be, um, People can be accommodated earlier if there are uh, specific circumstances, but in general, it usually takes two weeks. It was never intended to be something where someone was in a pain crisis or some kind of existential crisis called um, for an assisted death and someone would come within hours. It was, it was never intended to be. So what is the eligibility criteria? The first one is that the individual must be eligible for funded health services in Canada. That was very specifically put into the law so that uh, it wasn't going to be a tourist thing, that people from other countries couldn't come here to have an assisted death. They have to be 18 years of age and capable of making medical decisions. They have to have a grievous 
an irremediable medical condition, which I'll explain in a minute on the next slide. The request has to be voluntary and not as a result <coughs> of any external pressure. And the, it has, they have to have informed consent after reviewing all options especially and specifically including palliative care, and that is written right into the legislation. So what is a grievous and irremediable medical condition? So the person must have all of the following. They have to have a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability. They have to be in an advanced state of irreversible decline in capability but that decline does not necessarily have to be linked to the incurable illness. They have to be enduring suffering that is intolerable to them and that the, any ways of alleviating that suffering are not tolerable to them. And their natural death needs to be reasonably foreseeable. So you can see in what um, Dr. Weeb often says when she's talking about this slide is that it, it is a bit gray particularly around the reasonably foreseeable. And again, we can talk more about that. <coughs> aid is not permitted with minors, not even emancipated minors, so you have to be 18 years of age. It is not permitted with an advanced directive or living will. You cannot say ahead of time in writing or through a proxy that this is what you would want at some point in the future. And mental illness cannot be the only medical condition. It can be um, a condition that people who have a mental illness, perhaps like depression, as long as they meet all the other criteria, are not um, excluded because of that mental illness, but it cannot be the sole condition. Now, these three um, circumstances. circumstances, yeah. Um, are currently being looked at by government because when the legislation came into effect in 2016, I think the government gave themselves about two, two years, years yeah, to look at these specific issues. And I think each of these has a working group or a group that is talking to experts and trying to come up with some recommendations around. So um, I'm just going to quickly tell you a little bit about the Manitoba Team, but Fred will do this in more detail in a minute, or is this, yes. So we started out with three physicians. We now have 11 physicians here in Manitoba who are part of the, the MAID team. All of them have other positions and other jobs, other than Dr. Weeb, who does the work full-time as, as the director of our program. There are currently three nurses, two of whom are part-time. Uh, Megan and Fred actually were the first two social workers on the MAID team when it first began way back in February of 2016, and I joined in December. And in August last year, uh, we were able to get a 0.8 permanent position social worker as part of the team. Fred, Megan, and I all work part-time on a casual basis with the team. So sometimes when people say, wow, you have four <coughs> social workers, how did you get that? But it's actually only probably the equivalent of 1.2 EFT. There were two pharmacists who were very involved with us at the beginning of setting everything up. We have a speech language uh, pathologist who works with us because early on it was discovered that people who have communication difficulties, she was um, invaluable in helping us communicate to people with ALS who've had strokes or, or other issues, and we have an admin assistant. Our service is situated in Winnipeg, but we cover all of Manitoba. Um, and even though we are considered the healthcare providers on the main team, we welcome the participation of other healthcare providers in, in the facilities that we, we are involved in or the particular healthcare providers that that person and family may be already involved with. We thought it might be of interest to you to see what some of our statistics have been up until, yeah, very recent, up until February 12th, I guess that was Monday. Um, Manitoba, for those of you who don't know, is a, a province of 1.2 million people. 
mighty province. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, we are only 1.2 million people. Um, and more than 50% live in Winnipeg. I think it's around 60% live in Winnipeg. So since, and I think these stats are since February of 2016, uh, we've had 488 contacts. So that's basically phone calls into the office, people asking. 210 written requests. You can see how that is increasing, that there were only 42 in 2016. We had 142 in 2017. And already in the first six weeks of this year, we've had 26. We've had 100 people who've died with assistance. Again, you can see that those numbers are increasing. 24 in 2016, 63 in last year, and so far 13. Most of those people have cancer, uh, the vast majority. Um, but there were a, just under 140 who died unassisted. 40 of whom were already previously approved for MAID. So they, they didn't, uh, for a number of reasons, um, call us to have an assisted death. Um, and we have noticed, and we can again talk more about this later, how uh, for many people, just knowing that they can have the assisted death has relieved anxiety and then they never call. For others, they may have died naturally, um, they lost the capacity. To, uh, yeah, there was some 36 lacked capacity, um, and there were. Um, oh, sorry, those are breast declined. Yeah, some people lack capacity at, okay. towards the end. That's right. Um, and there are just a whole variety of reasons why people die unassisted. 81 of those 210 written requests were declined by us. Five, because they didn't meet criteria, because it was mental illness only. 36, because they lacked capacity to go through the eligibility procedures and assessments. And uh, 40, because the natural death was not in the foreseeable future. 30 requests were withdrawn on their own, so those are people who decided on their own to, to, to not move forward. And uh, over 150 were for information only. So you can see that out of all the contacts, actually only about 20% follow through with an assisted death. And again, this is something that Kim underlines, and I think we'd all agree with that that's why it's so important to have these conversations and to recognize that having the conversation is not going to lead necessarily to an assisted death. It's going to lead to a conversation, and that's the critical piece. <coughs> So what's our experience in terms of why, why people are asking for an assisted death? It's rarely because of physical symptoms. I think over 90% of the people who uh, are in contact with us and actually who have an assisted death are already on the palliative care program. Probably I think it's another 5% that we help get connected with the palliative care program. And we know that palliative care does an amazing job at controlling symptoms. And so, you know, physical symptoms of physical pain are rarely why people are asking for an assisted death. Much more commonly, it's a desire for control. So for, and a, a sense of autonomy, because there's so many people having the illness that they have, the disability, the decline, whatever it is that's going on in their life, has taken away so much of their control, so much of their choice, and this is one way that they can control it. I'm thinking about uh, a gentleman that we saw a few weeks ago who had a friend, actually, who was a, a gentleman with cancer, and uh, he had a friend who was, and told us a story of, of having this conversation with his friend where the friend said, well, you know what, I can see how this is a way that you've really beaten cancer because you've taken control. You're not letting the cancer get you. You're, you're making the decision about when you're going to die and how you're going to die. And that, for that person, was found that very, very comforting. Another common reason is just being done, just saying, I have no quality of life. I'm just done with this. And for sure, a sense many, many people that their loss of independence, that having to rely on others for 
so many, so much of their care, so much of, of their day-to-day -day life, and a sense of really losing their identity through their illness and wanting to maintain that identity, wanting to maintain that personhood. Many people will say to us, I, I want to still be me when I die. I, don't want, I want to still feel like myself, feel like I know who I am and what's going on. When <clears throat> so this is my last slide before I turn this over to Fred. So just to remember that it's not uh, medically assisted death versus palliative care. It's palliative care with or without a medically assisted death. Palliative care is a huge piece of this work still. The option of a medically assisted death might be new in Canada, but the desire to die is not new. And for those of us who've worked in this field for a long time, we are very, very aware of that. And those end-of-life conversations that we've had as part of our work do not need to change. People are, I think, probably still find it difficult to find people to have those conversations with. And whether there's a medically assisted death is a possibility or not, those conversations don't need to change. People also, and people have told us this over and over again, this has nothing to do with the, the quality of their health care. They talk about how well cared for they are, how great their health care providers have been. That is not the reason that they're choosing an issue. And as, again, therefore, as Kim would say, this doesn't mean that we failed the person um, in as being a health care provider in any way, whether it's in the role of social workers or physicians or nurses or anyone else on the team, because it really is coming from a very different place. It has nothing to do with care. Okay, so now I get to turn this over to Fred and... Jill was speaking at 33 speed, if you're familiar with records, and I'm going to speak at 78. No, I'm, I'm, I'll try and be as, as slow and as measured as you. That was perfect. <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about what's happening in Manitoba and also then outline some of the things from a social work perspective, some of the clinical issues and things to be uh, thinking about when we're doing the work that we're doing. Um, Certainly, so in Manitoba, we are, as, as Jill said earlier, we're a provincial program based in Winnipeg, so we, there is one point of entry, so there's an, a place where people can contact us. We have an office and set up there, so, they, so the contact will come in, the request will come for information or for wanting to go further and have an assessment will come in. A triage is done, uh, which is uh, by one of the nurses on our team, and uh, we're gathering information just to sort of see whether... Um, what, the, what the request is all about and whether it's anywhere near fitting the criteria as far as from a, even from a medical perspective in, in terms of eligibility. So it's and enough to proceed to do the assessment. So that's kind of what the tri triad is all about. They will review the chart and discuss, uh, again, with, with the uh, physicians on the team to sort of see um, is there any kind of red flags or anything that uh, warrant uh, or does not warrant uh, going ahead further. And then we will proceed with the assessments. And as Jill said earlier, a plus or minus speech language, uh, uh, which has been an invaluable uh, addition to our team for sure. Uh, then it's about doing the assessment. And uh, uh, for every assessment, uh, we, have, we have two uh, independent members of our team, two teams, if you will, within our team, uh, doing the assessments because we need two independent assessments. So we no discussion between those teams uh, between uh, before or between uh, those assessments, and then we meet together afterwards to discuss our outcomes, uh, reviewing uh, our, our understanding of, of what happened during that assessment uh, and what we think in terms of eligibility or, or not, or not, yay or nay. Um, the assessments could last anywhere from one to two hours. There's no real, uh, it really is pretty uh, fluid there. We are going to be exploring things like uh, why does a person why is a person requesting it why now in their life we're we're assessing and we're wondering about and we're going to talk a little more detail about this looking at, at suffering we want to know uh, whether they're aware of alternatives uh, in terms of uh, both uh, you know what why why not a natural death why not uh, if they wanted to live longer and 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 maybe get to a point of requiring uh, palliative sedation at the end of life or uh, things like that, we might be sort of pursuing those kind of alternatives. And we are also going to talk about unmet needs. We're really wondering, you know, what's happening for people that they're requesting, and we really want to pursue that avenue, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that. So we'll review the whole process 
uh, with the person during the assessment, the person and their family, I might add. Pe people are welcome to have anybody they want to have uh, at the interview, uh, and, and they could be participate in the assessments as well, and we welcome that. We'd like to see the family there. Uh, legally, there's no obligation for people to uh, have their family there, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that later too. Uh, so we review the whole uh, assisted death process, what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, the fact that we're going to start two IVs in case one uh, fails, we want to have a second one on hand. We're going to talk about the medication used uh, during, the, during the procedure. We're going to talk about uh, you know, what, what it's going to look like, what, what, are, what, it's, what the patient is going to, person is going to experience, what the family are going to see, and we're going to have all those kind of discussions with people openly. And then we spend time alone with the patient. And my understanding is this isn't actually legislated to have time alone with the patient, but it's part of a Manitoba College of Physicians and Surgeons guidelines that you have to have time alone with the patient. And the reason for that is to sort of, again, uh, assess whether there's any form of coercion, but it's also, and all along the way, we are giving the individual opportunities to say, you know what, this isn't for me, or I want to change my mind, and we tell them uh, very frankly that you can change your mind or withdraw from this at any point along the way, uh, to the point that we also say, we can show up, on the, on the, everything's gone ahead, you've picked a date, we come, we've got, we're all there, your family's all there, we're going to spend time alone with you again and say, are you sure you want to go ahead with this right now? Are there another time you want to wait or whatever, that's, that's all okay with us. Because if you don't want to go ahead with it, uh, you don't necessarily have to tell everybody else that you don't want to go ahead with it. We'll tell them that you're not ready to go ahead with it. From our perspective, it's not on, and we can take the responsibility for that. So you always have an option to sort of say, I don't want to go ahead with this. Um, and I think that's interesting when we do that because a lot of people really appreciate knowing that they have uh, that last time to make that choice if they don't want to go ahead. But I was just wondering, I was just... As you were talking, and we keep talking about the death process and explaining to the family what happens and what it looks like to I'm thinking you didn't really say what that was, and I'm wondering if you say a little bit more about it. We, we've just said there's two IVs. Yeah, and basically what happens is basically people are given um, uh, there's three medications, and the first medication basically puts people to sleep. And a lot of people sometimes, depending on the frailty of their condition, may die shortly after that first medication. The whole procedure takes at most 15 minutes. And we, and we mentioned that to the person and, and also the family. So that, and what you're going to see, and we say to the family, you're going to see someone actually nod off. You may hear some signs of breathing changes or different, uh, maybe some gurgling sometimes. Maybe a person might say something that might sound a little weird because they're almost going into what might seem like a more of a, uh, a drunken state or anything, but it's not. Very seldom that happens too. And then basically you're going to see changes in a person's color and, um, and that's basically what you're going to see. So, you know? and, no, and no kind of loss of control of bladder, no loss of control of bowel or anything like that. That I doesn't happen. People feel extremely relieved to hear that. It's they, amazing they're how very often relieved. when we say that yeah. they say they're Yeah, they're very, they're very relieved to hear that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to. Yeah, good. Can you go to the next slide? Probably. I... There we go. Okay, here we are. And so, also in Manitoba, what's different, probably it's, uh, and we're not really sure how it's handled in other provinces completely, uh, but we have a team and we have these two independent parts of our team that are, have done the assessments, and now we get together as a team to discuss uh, whether a person is eligible or not. Uh, that discussion can be very, it's important to have a very open discussion. We feel very, uh, this is crucial to sort of, uh, there's lots to sort of consider when we're making this, and we take it pretty, because this is ending someone's life. You really have to be taking all the factors into, that come into play. So our model is really not to work necessarily on consensus. It's not a matter of saying, uh, oh, someone disagrees or someone says, you know, I don't think this is the way to, I don't think this is right, I don't think it fits or whatever. And it's not like other people are going to make, well, this is why I think it fits. And it's not like we're try having discussions about that. Our approach is that we will have an open discussion, we'll air it all out, and then if one member of the team says, no, this is, I just don't feel this is right, we do not go ahead. And that's the way, basically how we form our decision making. So that might be a unique approach that may not be happening in other places, I'm not sure. 
The other thing that we do is we offer all the individuals uh, what is called dignity therapy, and there's a link there on, on, uh, the, on the slide and, and in your resource list. Uh, dignity therapy uh, established uh, Harvey Chachanoff, a psychiatrist here in Winnipeg, and a team of people have really uh, established this uh, over the years. And it's an opportunity for people to engage in a discussion about their life, basically. It's a life review. It's to answer some questions that are geared at helping them to talk about and reflect on important uh, or different aspects of their life. And that that is done. Uh, we offer that to people to have a, a chance to do that and, and do it individually, uh, either with one of our team or other people that do dignity therapy. And it involves a recorded conversation. And then the recorded conversation is made into a transcript. And that transcript becomes a, a a book, almost like a little book that then can be left behind for the family to uh, be as a legacy of that person's life. So that's something that we do uh, in Manitoba. And not everyone takes us up on that offer, and I'm even not sure of the numbers that take us up on that offer. I don't think we have that data for you, but um, so we'll just go ahead to the next slide. Uh, this was really meant to just sort of give you an idea of the social, as social workers, our role, and it's a multifaceted one. And so I mentioned the assessments were, were involved in the assessments, and we'll, again, we'll be talking a bit more about some of the things we've learned from that. We also are involved being present, uh, and really, I think we play a role, obviously in the assessments, we play a, a role of being um, privy to sort of a really opening up the discussion on a variety of levels. And I, I think I'm gonna talk more about that in the next couple of slides. At the assisted death, we're really conscious of of being there to support not only that individual who's, who's about to die, but also their family, and also each other. It's really a time that we really uh, are really very conscious of, of supporting each other. And that can be um, a very moving and impactful experience for sure. Uh, we're involved in pre-briefs and debriefs, sometimes within facilities. When we go into a facility and we would meet with the team who is on that uh, ward of the hosp hospital or facility, wherever we are, uh, to talk about what we're, what we're there, what we're going to do, and explain the, the whole process and procedure, and open up a bit of a dialogue about so what have people been thinking about this? Um, are there some concerns or thoughts or just feelings that, that people want to talk about in terms of, of just being open to sort of uh, recognizing that this is something, again, new in Canada, and, and how, how, are, how are people dealing with uh, what's going on there. And we will also then spend time with the different uh, teams, and we do this with our own team too, both before and after, but afterwards to talk, uh, again, just sort of debrief about uh, where people are at and, and discuss kind of what went on there. Um, we put family follow-up here. We do a limited amount of family follow-up when, when we are doing the assessments in terms of if we identify, uh, or after the uh, assisted death as well, if we identify someone who we feel would, it would be beneficial to contact them in terms of bereavement, uh, we, we offer a limited amount of uh, follow-up. Well, we do follow them to sort of see what's going on. We actually are going to be starting and running a bereavement group uh, this March and April. It will be the first group. Um, gathering together family members of people who have died uh, from an assisted death uh, since we started. And uh, I think right now the group is up to about 13 members are going to be part of that group. We, we purposely uh, won't um, really be following people after we do the assessment, and they may have uh, been deemed eligible, but we don't provide follow-up to those families. We really make it clear to them. Uh, we will, if people we feel are in need of support and need linking with other resources, we'll do that for sure, or make sure that they have the help and the support they need. But we aren't going to be the ones that are going to initiate contact once they have been approved. The feeling is that we don't really want to sort of out of the blue be pointing them, so how are things going? And for that to have any sort of inference that, uh, have you thought about it? I think it's time, it's a nice day for, or, no, <laughs> we're, not going to be, we're not going to be thinking of that. So we really have to be um, uh, very conscious of that. The ball's in their court. And that earlier statistic that Jill alluded to where people die unassisted and 40 of them have been approved for made, uh, that is really our, reinforces the notion that for a lot of people going through this process, uh, they are able to live longer knowing that they have made in their back pocket. And that kind of is a supportive thing, and they don't have to go through with it necessarily. So that, that is a very strong factor that we're very conscious of. Um, client feedback, we're always looking to sort of uh, understand. I mentioned dignity therapy, and we engage in a lot of uh, uh, education to both health caregivers and to the general public to try and demystify what this whole process is all about and really to talk about that uh, 
And it, again, this slide really shows the variety of things that we're doing from a social work perspective. I'm conscious of time here. We've got lots of time. We've got lots of time? Yeah, so slow down. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 keep it. Okay. So <laughs> just a couple of general uh, considerations when we think about this, this whole conversation, general principles. Um, so first of all, I think Jill alluded to earlier that uh, being made neutral, that's, that's an important part of this whole process. We are not there, we are there to provide, not to promote. We want to inform uh, and we want to provide access, uh, but we don't want to convince a person one way or the other. Uh, it's important that the whole notion mentioned earlier about uh, the, someone requesting this not being seen as a sign of failure for the health caregivers, also for the family members. For a lot of family members, they may be feeling that very same way. They may be feeling, well, why, why does I... And there, there are a lot of differences in families. There, there are differences in families regardless of what happens. As you know, as social workers, we often run into situations where, you know, families, um, you know, we're not all the Waltons, and we're, there's lots of stuff going on. And at time of uh, when you're dealing with terminal illness, I've experienced in palliative care over the years, or in this is no different either. Uh, whatever has been in how whatever dynamics are happening within that family, they only get sort of intensified because of dealing with this situation and all the decision making and all the mixed emotions and all the variety of feelings. So there are going to be people that are going to be on board with this, and there are going to be people within the family that aren't on board, and there are going to be a lot of people in totally different places. So it's really, really important to recognize that the family is often in those different places. Um, so we really, uh, yeah. So we we are there to assure a respectful. Uh, process and no matter what the outcome is that people aren't abandoned. That's another thing that we're really conscious of. And recognizing that it is a process. This is an opportunity to explore, tease out subtleties and ambiguities, encourage reflection, discussion, understanding around uh, options and needs. It's really, that's what this is about. This is a really important principle that it's about uh, opening up a process and a dialogue and looking at um, and doing this as a team. I can't imagine not doing this as a team. Because the team provides not only different different perspectives from professional perspectives, perspectives, but it also provides different human beings that provide a different take on just individual reactions and, and exploring and evaluating things. And how do you evaluate things like suffering? You don't evaluate suffering uh, from a point of a checklist. You, evalu you really understand suffering from really understanding where people are coming from. Seeing family as a focus, I've already alluded to that in some respects. Um, we are really conscious of, uh, of um, sometimes people will, if we've had a couple of occasions out of all those contacts where people have said, no, I'm not going to tell my family or I'm not going to include them. And that's a bit of a red flag for us. We're really wondering what's the motivation behind that. Oftentimes it's around protection and we will engage. I think the social workers on the team are probably the ones that are really engaging folks with a bit of a thorough, more in-depth discussion about well, what's happening there and, and can we talk about that protection piece and can we talk about kind of does that, is that helpful or is that more isolating to your family members and are there ways that we can help bridge that gap in some, stuff, in some ways? So we'll, we'll do things like that. And recognizing the impact on team. This is a general principle that goes without saying. Um, as I said earlier, I can't imagine you need a well-functioning team to do this work and I don't know how you could do it without a team. Um, you need trust, respect, you need to be acknowledged differences, you need to be, um, it really, this is, there's a lot of pressure on us to do this right. And to put all that pressure on one or two individuals, I'm not sure how that would work, uh, quite frankly, just uh, doing this in terms of a, uh, a team. Okay. Sure, go for it. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, go back a little bit again to the family of the focus of care. Sure. Because I think about the whole right to an assisted death as the ultimate in self-determination, that the focus so much yeah. in the assessment is it's what this person wants, it's only what this person wants. It's almost like everybody else is discounted, it's only that person. And obviously that's the right thing. It is yeah. absolutely yeah. this person's decision. But I, I do I just want to emphasize that 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 other lens of who else is being impacted by this, particularly family, is a, a, a critical piece that we bring to this. Exactly, and we're really thinking of families, um, and we're thinking of down the road too. That whole that we mentioned about bereavement. A lot of times, we're doing during those assessments for for made. We're also thinking in terms of risk assessment for bereavement. We're wondering 
what we in getting the picture and, and collaborating, really getting the picture of what's going on in that family, we're getting a sense of where people are at in terms of, of really maybe some of the issues and stuff around around these. Okay, so right, <laughs> um, we're just gonna I'm just gonna finish my last couple of slides and then we're gonna get into some discussion. Well, actually, there's three more slides. Um, <laughs> but this is a this is a quote that uh, David Browning is a pediatric. Uh, palliative, uh, palliative care uh, social worker in Boston, who's a great educator, and uh, I've always liked his work, and I've I've, I've carried this uh, quote with me uh, because I think it is a philosophical underpinning for all, our work in in this work and probably any work we do, uh, especially. And I think uh, as it goes, as he says there, effective communication takes place when we can move fluidly uh, between our position as experts and our position as curious, underlining curious and respectful and fellow human beings, such relationships are shaped by mutuality and reciprocity. The bottom line on that is that we aren't delivering a service. Um, you deliver pizza. We aren't delivering bad news. Uh, we aren't delivering uh, a, 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 a decision on whether yay or nay. We are engaging uh, in a process. Uh, we are engaging in a very significant process is a really important time of people's lives. And I think, and recognizing that this is mutual in the sense that we are reaching out to some other, some people, and but they're impacting us too. So it's a two-way street, it's not a one-way street. And I think this quote always helps me uh, to keep me grounded on that particular process. And especially in our process, especially in our process, uh, you could approach this work uh, with a checklist. Do you meet the criteria? Check, check, check. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, we need to be really engaging people to really understand what is happening here for people. What is going on in this person's life? Why are they experiencing what they're, or what, why are they after uh, having, wanting to end their life? So we really need to sort of, um, you know, be conscious. And I guess the next, leads into a nice segue into what are the major clinical uh, key components of, of, uh, of doing this work? Establishing a relationship. Um, again, I think social work is very good at this. <laughs> and I think we, um, and we have a lot of uh, really uh, psychosocially oriented people on this team. We have physicians that are, are very, uh, very sensitive, very compassionate, and very understanding uh, although probably always uh, marvel sometimes at the kind of thing, questions that we might be asking or even some of the things that we might be, um, you know, sort of like I always remember a physician once saying to me, well, why did you stay in the room and talk to the family? I, I thought we were finished when we had that family conference. Um, it's kind of that same kind of principle here that I think sometimes not having an awareness maybe for what has just been generated in our discussion and really being able to pick up on some of the nuances of, of how we communicate with one another. So we need to be really good at establishing relationships. We really need to recognize coming in, this is a pretty tense time for people, obviously, when they're sort of making this decision. And they're really, there's all kinds of mixed things going on for that individual and their family. And so we really need to somehow be able to create a very safe, a very secure uh, environment, uh, recognizing that this isn't a test, that we really want to get to know who you are and we want you to get to know us too. It's a very important for us. It's very significant, especially for those physicians who are ultimately injecting that medication. It is very important for them to know who you are and what you're about. And I can't just drop in and, and do this without knowing something about what's going on here and more about you and how you think and what your values are and, and who you are. Um, and I think that's a very important part of this whole process. And that's about really establishing relationships. The whole notion of determining or the idea of, of uh, determining eligibility, I think where we play a, a big role too is um, we talked earlier about, about suffering and, and I really, there's another resource here that I think is important to look at. Uh, Mike Carlos, a physician in palliative care, uh, talks about having that ongoing conversation, especially in light, he's the head of palliative care here in, in Winnipeg and uh, Manitoba, and um, he talks, uh, the article is titled uh, Sit Down, Lean In, it's on the Canadian Virtual Hospice website, um, and he really talks about paying attention and really making offers to people to hear what their suffering is all about versus 
uh, not engaging with people around it. Uh, we have to do more engaging, not less, <laughs> uh, to really understand that. And I think in terms of we, we too, we really want to understand kind of where, what, what, what's the meaning of that suffering for this person? Why, what is happening for them? What, what, what kind of, kind of things have they experienced? What has led them to this? What kind of experiences they had with death? What, how much of a motivating factor is that that they've experienced someone else die, and I don't want to go die that way? And how do I? Is this going to happen to me? Well, what, what do they know? Do they know information about? what it would be like for their own death if they talked to anybody or are they assuming that it's all it's, it's the worst thing that can happen and I can't imagine going through this. So it's really, really trying to tease out kind of what's happening for people. Um, and so we're really concerned more about getting the full picture and the eligibility criteria are going to take care of themselves in terms of really understanding whether they, whether they meet those eligibility criteria. Um, and I guess we uh, an, another quote that I again I don't don't have the source for this, but just to back to suffering. It, it, suffering is an interpretation of experience, not a sum of symptoms, uh, which I think is very relevant for this discussion. <laughs> it's really understanding what that means to that person. It's kind of really what we're after, and we're going to do whatever we can uh, during those discussions to do that. And similarly, the next point about assessing for unmet needs. That's kind of another really important part of, of all of us play a role in that, all team members. But I think we're going to be, as social workers, I think we're going to be sensitive to some of the nuances and some of the open doors that you're going to see during those conversations. And maybe some other people may not be totally as tuned into that as we are. I, we don't own that territory because I think there's a lot of overlap in how we operate as a team. But I think sometimes we might be really uh, looking at, uh, at sort of Somebody might say, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, but they might say, oh, I, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, well, no, I don't know. I, I, just can't, I, I, I just can't put up with that anymore. And they might have been talking about sort of a relationship in their family or something like that. And we might sort of say, oh, well, you know, we, we would sort of say, okay, I'm not, I don't want to, you know, tell me what you want to tell me, but I'm going to say, well, what, tell me, I'm just curious, what, what do you mean when you say that? And so we're going to be going down that road with people a lot more. And, it's, and we're going to be sort of really encouraging asking open-ended versus closed questions. Um, so uh, sort of you could, you could say something like, um, what is your, uh, are, you know, are you interested in palliative care? No, I don't want palliative care. Uh, versus you can say, what's your understanding of what palliative care is all about? which is going to probably give you a bit of a different response. So those are just a couple of examples of what we're going to do. The other thing that we're re and so we're really trying to figure out unmet needs in terms of are there things going on there that people are just kind of, they might be checking out because they don't know how to go down the road of dealing with some of those unmet needs. So we're going to be very, uh, very open to trying to sort of see where those flags are and, and open up discussion about that. And I guess the other thing that we're quite... Uh, I always see as a big part of our role is, is to uh, tease out ambivalence. Uh, ambivalence is a big part of living, and it, ambivalence is a big part of dying as well. There's a lot of mixed feelings about leaving, and um, we know that ambivalence is normal, but we also want to just, you know, just bring it up and sort of say, are there times when you think you sort of have mixed feelings about making this decision, or maybe mixed feelings about, can you, can you talk a little more about that? And some people are pretty, uh, very matter of fact, very quickly and say, no, I know, I know exactly what I want. And, you know, and other people are saying, well, yeah, no, I, I do have mixed feelings. And then that doesn't mean, that, oh, well, they shouldn't be doing it. But then you can have a way of understanding, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to them? And it opens up some doors to discuss other things that might be going on for them. So that's the other thing that, that I think is really important. And then offering support to patients and families and recognizing the needs of children we added there. Um, just families in general, we want information that's so important to, to families to have at every stage of the process. Recognizing the needs of individual family members, that again, that, that we talked about earlier, that it's not the same for everybody. Acknowledge the differences and help families to communicate about their differences sometimes. That might be something that's happening right before our eyes during the assessments or, or especially how is the actual, when we come to assist someone to die. My, my example of that was a, a long time estrangement between a mother and a daughter and the, the, the daughter, the, the mother said, I don't even know if my daughter's going to show up for this. And they, she does. The daughter shows up a few days, and they kind of 
they to not totally reconciled. It wasn't like a holiday, uh, ending, Hollywood ending, but it was sort of a chance for those two to get together. And even during the, when the person was actually being assisted to die, this is the uh, woman who said, uh, it's my party, and I'll die if I want to. She had about 18 people in the room, and anyway, it's a whole other scene to walk into. Uh, but her daughter was there, and, and just as she was getting ready and getting, you know, in a separate room to get all ready to to uh, have her life ended, um, uh, I was very conscious of the fact that her daughter wasn't there with her. And I went to talk to her, and I said, do you want your daughter here with you, right beside you right now? And uh, she said, yeah, but I don't really want to ask her. I said, well, you know, we could ask her. And if she doesn't want to come, that's, that's going to be her, her stuff. But we can go talk to her and see if that's okay with her. And, and sure enough, um, she was quite um, willing to go, but she didn't know how to go. She didn't know, you know, all that. Kind of, so it's kind of facilitating something as important as that, that, you know, you know I mean, again, I'm not sort of saying that we're the only people who can do that, but that, that's going to have, we're going to be aware of those potential uh, kind of uh, examples of, of getting things together. Um, just, a, just a few words about children, too. We often uh, will be dealing with families, and they're asking about how to uh, how to talk to children about about um, a medical assistance in dying. And, and actually, there's a great resource, Andrea Warnick, who's a, a great person who's written a lot about children's grief and operates her own practice in Toronto area, has also been a, a major contributor to kidsgrief.ca, and I encourage people to go on, and she has a whole chapter in there about talking to children about medical assistance in dying. I'll just quote one of the things she says on one of her slides, because I think it's really an important one, and it's about with children, um, choice sometimes gets misinterpreted. Uh, using the word choice with children has potential to be problematic, if not clarified. Emphasize that the individual isn't choosing death over life, but rather how to die. Talk about how much the person wishes that he or she could stay alive and spend more time with that child. So, that, so really, that's that real whole that interpretation. That's just one example. And then finally, um, bereavement. Um, we're talking about, I mentioned earlier, about assessing risk. We're going to be promoting other resources. And again, there's another great website, mygrief.ca. Um, but we're going to um, make sure that people are uh, at least have some contact and know about the resources in their area and that kind of thing. Okay, just back to sort of my final slide, and then we're going to open it up for questions. And that's talking about a bit about the personal and professional impact. I don't want to take a lot of time doing this because I don't want to cut into the questions. So we could spend <laughs> probably more time, and we will talk about more about it, maybe in the question and answer period. But just recognizing that we need to have both informal and formal ways of really supporting one another. Our team meetings are a place where we often will do what, like a form of what we call death review, where we'll talk about all the all the deaths that we've been involved with, and really really have an opportunity to really just really just under you know for everybody who wasn't there to hear about what happened and, and what it was like for everyone and have an open discussion about hearing what happened, but also have a chance to evaluate and look at well what did we do what could we learn from the situation what was the experience like for the families what you know what was the experience like for the individuals what was how did that impact ourselves so so we need that opportunity to sort of to have those kind of discussions on a regular basis and that has to be built into doing this work. Uh, it happens informally. It happens often right on, on the day that we, we're involved with uh, helping someone die. Uh, but it also has to happen sort of at different points along the way, I think, in a more structured way. Um, that's supporting ourselves and each other. just want to spend a few moments about talking about self-disclosure. Um, this has been quite a ride uh, for all of us. <laughs> and I think when Megan and I first got the call, we were happily retired. And uh, my, my comment was, never answer your phone when you're retired. Uh, but anyway, um, we, 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 get the, uh, we, get the, we get the call, and, and I had mixed feelings. I had worked many years in palliative care. Uh, in the palliative care community, we're, we were really wild about this whole concept of medical assistance and dying from the perspective of worrying about vulnerability, worrying about vulnerable people. How is it actually going to happen? Who's going to do it? Um, what what you know a lot of que we had a lot of questions I think and it really and it, how is that going to affect palliative care and 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 is it is it really fair to have people have an opportunity to have a medical assistance in death when really palliative care isn't available to people across this country in an equitable way and how fair is that so there, there's a lot of concerns anyway that was happening but at the same time when I accepted to join uh, the team I sort of felt like well 
I know something about dying. I know something about supporting families. I know, and I'm really concerned that how is this assessment going to happen? How are the decisions going to be made? And I really wanted to be part of maybe that part of it, to sort of be take a part of that. So I kind of uh, did, did join the team. But it was quite interesting that uh, during about a month after I joined the team, I was also invited to the palliative care community to do a presentation on psychosocial aspects of medical assistance in dying, not knowing that I was on that team, but just sort of, you know, looking at what are some of the considerations. And uh, during that presentation to about 100 members of our palliative care community, I, as I said, came out. And it was a bit of sort of saying, well, I've joined this team. And there's kind of like a collect, collective gasp in the audience. And, but it was, it was kind of like that's the experience that we've had. It's who do you talk to, especially in early going, who do you talk to about you're doing this work and not doing this work, and, and why are we so, why are we not talking about it? And anyway, there's a lot of mixed feelings about self-disclosure from that perspective, and that was my story, but maybe others have their story about what it was like for, you know, you know want to add anything? Well, this is Megan, and I, I think I remember all of what you've described, Fred, although I wasn't coming from the, I was coming from oncology rather than palliative care. But I, I do recall thinking, oh my goodness, what would I be getting into? And my husband said, are you sure? And then I heard that you were going to be involved, Fred. And so then it, it really helped to know someone else that I knew and trusted would be, we'd be working together. And, and you kind of get the sense, okay, this is complicated. There's stigma around it. It's going to be uh, difficult, but what a challenge, what an opportunity. And if we're together, we'll figure it out. Yes. Yeah, and, right. and I'm sure that's true for you folks, even if it's one person, never mind a whole service. If you get good people with you, you can figure it out. And I think it's also a window into what it's like for family yeah. in terms of who do they tell and how do they yeah. tell and yeah. how do you know how it's going to, what, what kind of reaction you're going to Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but, but I know for myself, similarly to both of you, that knowing that it was Fred and Megan helps a lot because it's okay, well, they're, they're in it, so it's going to be okay. <laughs> so, so coming third makes it easier. But the other thing is, in all honesty, my experience has been, over time, as I felt more brave mm -hmm. to tell people this is what I'm doing, I, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. That's right. And it's also how you say that. You know, I would say, you know, I don't know what you're going to think of this, or I'm yeah. not sure what your beliefs are. I don't know how this is for you, but... Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, it's but, but it's, I think it is a real window into what it's like for them. Well, it, it is, and I, that, that triggered a thought to my mind that this has happened a couple of times when, when you're talking. I remember being in someone's house, sitting in the living room, talking to sisters of a, a woman who was about to die, and, and the sister said, uh, yeah, this is surreal. This is kind of really weird that, um, that, that this, is, this is happening. I was just having coffee with some friends in the mall this morning, and they said, Oh, so what are you going on for this afternoon? Mm -hmm. And she's going to her sister's. This is the death at two o'clock. And she said, uh, "She said I just couldn't tell them, but it's kind of weird to, that, that I couldn't tell them." And you know that feeling. And I, I totally helps us relate to to what people feel. And, uh, and Fred, when you say that, that reminds me too that those are some of the things that we learn from patients and their families, and then we alert the next patient and family group. You might find that you're at the mall and someone, you know, you might find that. And yeah. so you kind of get your language. You help them cope yeah, them exactly, yeah. about how to cope with this sure. new experience. It's a lot. Yeah. And we it's kind of self-explanatory. Self-explanatory. Yeah. So maybe we, we don't need to read it. We're ready to go to questions. <laughs> <laughs> Are you with us still, Sally? <laughs> yeah, I am indeed. And, um, yeah, I'm going to just advance to the next slide where, um, Thank you, and questions oh, are, I, I just have, like, I mean, just before we get into the questions, I just have to say a huge thank you for this really, I mean, it's informative, but it's also really thoughtful. And I, I hope it's done a lot in terms of demystifying MAID and maybe alleviating some of the anxieties that I know that social workers have about it, and we, we, have, we have lots of questions rolling in, so I, I think I'm just going to sort of jump right into that. We, we got, um, so they're in kind of two camps, I guess, the questions. So some of them are more technical and maybe like process focused and they're maybe going to be a little bit um, easier to answer. So I'm going to start with those. So uh, the questions are sort of about 
the assessment process and eligibility. So for instance, someone asked, is Huntington's disease eligible for MAID? And then someone else is wondering, um, when MAID is denied, is that a team decision or is that an individual decision made by a doctor? So I guess to combine those sorts of, sorts of questions, you know, I'm asking you to speak, I guess the three of you speak generally about the nuances around eligibility and how that decision is actually made. Um, well, I guess in first first part, is Huntington's uh, eligible? Well, um, I don't know whether I can really speak to whether that, from a medical perspective, whether that's eligible or not. I think it really depends on the totality of a person's situation. Um, right, so there right. could be other things going on and, um, you know, so it's really hard to just sort of say yay or nay on just whether it is or it isn't. Uh, but there would be a, uh, uh, again, whether whether it's seen as being in the advanced stages of an illness, uh, it's probably going to be whether that person would be eligible or not. We have had, I know we have had someone with Huntington's, but they also had another cancer kind of going on for that person too at the same time. So it wasn't just Huntington's, there were other things going on. So that's all I can sort of say from our experience. I don't know if anybody... Yeah, I think it's the total. I think yeah. that language, the totality of what's going on in that situation, uh, because you even just to say if someone has cancer, are they eligible? It's, it's not just you have cancer, it's all, all yeah. these, all these yeah. other... Yeah, because it's partly that foreseeable death thing. It's, you might have Huntington's, but you might be stable. And, but but I, I even hesitate, and I think you, Jill, and Fred are as well, because we're not coming from a medical background, but also because really the thing is get people to the team or the physician or in your area who know these things. You don't have to know if someone, uh, because they can be asking for information, and that, and then the, they can share their own medical story. Yeah. So I would say that a person with Huntington's needs more information about a disease and death. a conversation. And yeah. a conversation. Yes. Yeah. So the next part of the question was around decision making. How do decisions get made around eligibility? Um, is it one person's decision? And, and maybe we can just clarify that again that um, there are two teams who go to assess. Each team is a nurse, a social worker, and a physician. Uh, both of those teams then have a discussion. I think what Fred was trying to say is that if one person of those six says, I'm really not comfortable, the other five of you may feel that they're eligible, but for this reason, I do not think they're eligible, then we would not go forward. So it, it, it is... Um, it isn't just one person's decision, but it also isn't a consensus building kind of thing where in another kind of team, if one out of five, six people said, well, I'm not so sure, the other five might try to talk them into why they should be thinking differently. And yeah. I think that's the main... Yeah, that's the main gist of it, yeah. So if we were to deny, I think it was around who, den who decides to deny someone, is that the question? Yeah, that, that was it, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I think it would be a team decision to say that this isn't, this doesn't work, and and that we would just that's how. And it they would say why. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes people are denied even before an assessment because it's clear in the triage process that they're not going to be eligible. Right. Yeah. So there, there were also some questions that came up um, around dementia. So just uh, you know about whether dementia is, is eligible and whether or not, um, or I guess how you handle those kinds of requests that you maybe know aren't going to be eligible. So, so it, I think you said, Jill, initially dementia, um, well, I'm going to say uh, competency is task specific. So that's important to remember that I may not be competent for putting together a grocery list and going and getting them, but I can say yes or no, and you can believe that I know what I'm saying if you ask me if you want my help to die. Did I get those pronouns right? I think so. I mean, I think it's whether you are competent to make a, a medical decision for yourself. That's the key piece. So if somebody has dementia and consistently, yes, consistently over time, because you have yeah. to have the, to be able to do that in two assessments and at the time of the actual having the, the death. Um, so again, I, I wouldn't want to say no, anybody with dementia, absolutely they are not eligible, but anyone who has is, is got someone else making uh, decisions for them for their medical care, they're not going to be eligible. No. And, and you can't make an advanced directive. And you cannot make an advanced directive. 
the second part of the question was how do we deal with people who are not eligible? That is really tricky because mm -hmm. for many people this is, they feel really let down, they feel really hopeless afterwards. Yeah. So I think right. that goes back to part of the triage, part of if we're further along in the process of the rapport and relationship building, it's so that we if we can say no and in an, in no in the most healing and helpful way and so that we can connect people to resources that might be helpful to them. To other resources, exactly. Uh, and, and, you know, each of these situations is so complex and but very often the, the doctors will sometimes say, be very blunt and say, you know, I can't do this. I will go to jail if I do this. This is not legal. You don't, don't meet the legal requirements. So as blunt as that. Or in other situations, I'm thinking of a gentleman that we saw who uh, was requesting him to death. But when we went out to see him, he was really quite isolated. He, his wife had only died about three weeks before then. And he really was saying, I'm lonely. Um, and I have nobody to talk to. I, I don't like my life like this anymore. And we were able to get him connected to um, actually move into a facility where he had a bit of a community and then he decided he didn't want an assisted death and he wouldn't have been eligible to start with so we didn't really have to deal with you're not eligible but rather dealing with the unmet needs. Wow. Did that yeah. answer that? Oh no I definitely yeah and I, early on in the presentation uh, there were more questions coming in that were you know quite technical or on the sort of legal side that I think you answered very well in going through sort of case scenarios of, of, of dying scenarios, I guess I would, I would call them. Um, there are a few sort of like lingering questions about that that I think people are curious about. One of them just being very technical, so it's, who and how are you deciding who to use for uh, independent witnesses? So the independent witnesses have to be somebody where the, they will not benefit in any way from the person's death. So that's usually right. family. Um, and so if that person... And they can't be providers. And they can't be health care providers are involved in their care. That's right. And so um, there's two things that happen. Often we'll ask the person whether they have, can think of someone that they would, would meet that criteria. Some people do. Uh, we then talk with them. Are you comfortable about that person knowing about your request and knowing about this to help them understand the implications of that? and they might move forward with that. I remember one guy who got his son to bring a couple of guys from his work yeah. uh, to do it, and he didn't care who knew, and that was fine. It, okay. Then when all else failed... Uh, just on that oh, one, sometimes it's helpful to tell people, to tell their witnesses, their personal witnesses, that you know, the person isn't saying, I agree you should ask for an assisted death. They're saying, I agree this is your signature, and you are who, you know. And you are who you say you are. Yes, yes exactly. and that's, that's, that's all, all it is. You're all only witnessing the signature. But there is a disclosure in having that that's right. for Absolutely. sure. Anyway, and then we also work with an organization that some of you may be familiar with called Dying with Dignity, who have volunteers who will come out and witness. And I would say quite a few people. Yeah. Wow. I, um, I'm going to move over to one that's a bit more about sort of your experience as practitioners. And so someone's asking, you know, each of you, have, have any of you found this traumatic at all? Um, and so, and if you haven't, what, you know, personal or professional traits do you think you have that are helping you do this work effectively? So I'm going to start just looking at other faces. Um, I think some of the professional traits that at least are helpful, they're no, got, they're no assur absolute insurance, but they're helpful, is to have developed a, some capacity for self-reflection. Um, I'm, I'm a, avoiding using self-care, but that's certainly part of it. Um, for me, working casually, that helps me to be more balanced in what I'm doing. Um, but that's me, because some of us are good at being balanced in the midst of busy lives, too, or full work lives. But I think it's really important to know, to be, have developed a skill of reflecting on where is this Megan's problem or Megan's issues or reminding Megan of sadness in my own life, or where is the patient? So that helps me, at least that's one piece of that puzzle. Right. I think 
Yeah, I don't, I don't feel that I've been traumatized for sure. I'll just say that right off the hop. Uh, in reality, these are very, very peaceful deaths that I'm witnessing. I feel like there's no question because nobody who's present at the death hasn't been present at at least one assessment. So we're not walking into something brand new. And I know that this is absolutely what this person wants. 100% and that they meet criteria. So, and just knowing that it's what the person wants, even though it's the sadness is always there, it's always still all the issues of someone dying, of loss uh, for the family, for that person themselves losing their life, that's all present. But it's such a peaceful death. And I think because I've come from a background in oncology and been mm. working with people who have, have died, I've, I've also witnessed death previously different kinds of death, aware of how death can be pretty messy. And so I, I don't feel traumatized by that, not by that part. Um, it's very hard. I know when I first started and we were first doing the assessments, and I think we've learned along the way so that it, less, it feels less like this, but the very first one I went to, I just, I just felt like this person felt like they were had to pass an exam, that they were so desperate to be eligible assessment. within yeah. the assessment, and that anxiety was so high. Like those are the things that stick with me. That just how much, you, how much it feels to them that literally my life is in your hands. Of you making this decision, can I do? Can I have this or can't I have that? So those are the pieces that are kind of in my head, not not the actual death. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I guess for me, one of the like I didn't feel traumatized either. Although it was interesting, we did a presentation to a group of uh, counselors, a uh, chair care counseling group, and they talked about trauma and was it, tra was it traumatic for the families too. And, um, and that got us thinking and thinking about, well, has it, like, mm -hmm. what is our experience? Of, and we haven't really had that experience either that has been traumatic. But I know for me, it's the skill uh, or what, I, as Megan said, and I just echo their comments, but I'd also say, yeah, it's just about being, um, as I said earlier in one of those slides, a fellow human being, yeah. and just witnessing. Um, I remember the first, I, the first uh, being present when someone died. Again, sort of surreal. We've used a lot in terms of describing, <laughs> because you're literally talking to someone, and this particular person was very. Um, she was just such a, a, an engaging, full of life kind of person, but she was also living with a very. Uh, she was so incapacitated in her breathing and difficulty talking, and she was just really at the literally, uh, you know, end of her, like totally could understand why she wanted to end her, her life to be ended. Um, but just to watch that switch go off, like literally for her to be joking one moment and then, then to watch the color sort of fade and leave, life leave her. Uh, I found very moving and not so much upsetting as much as just kind of, wow, like that's quite an experience to experience this. And that's kind of how I, re so having that well, skill or whatever, just being being open to experiencing that, I guess, is what I felt at that time. Wow. And I, I really want to underline what Craig said about just being, just being who you are as well as being yeah. the social worker on the MAID team is just, yeah, and so much of that is also about modeling and giving permission for family members to be who they are. Yeah. yeah. And then that makes for a more genuine experience all around with what you want. One thing we didn't say about families, I just want to get in there quickly before the next question, is that sometimes we are really working with families too because some people are very ambivalent about being present during the, uh, during the uh, actual uh, of helping someone to die, and we really give people permission to sort of really want to do that publicly with the family together to say, you know, you don't have to be present too, and really giving them permission to not be there, because uh, sometimes there's there's some inherent pressure to be there too. Yeah, and I think we we will say something like that in front of the family and the patient too. Exactly. That if if the patient wants you present, think about how you yourself want to be present because yeah. you you. Uh, it won't be a measure of whether you love them if you're in the next room or if you're sitting on the bed holding their hand. Like it has to work for everybody, and then that opens it up so that they can all talk again about their own individual needs yeah. Yeah. And, and ways they can support. 
I don't want to take up time, but yeah, I just really want to say this one more thing. And I promise I'll stop. It's just another ahead, thing that we do is, is uh, because it reminded me when Megan was talking, is talk to people about what what would you like that day to look like? Yeah. You know, who would you like to have present yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. What kind of music would you like playing if you like music? Yeah. Uh, what do you want around you? I, I remember going into uh, one where um, the woman had on a favorite negligee at um, she used to wear for her husband, and you know she would joke about she was going to see him on the other side, so she wanted to wear this. Um, <laughs> and so just so being able to plan in ways that we normally are not able to plan about what that would really look like and feel like. And yeah. there's been all kinds of yeah. there's been there's I billions did, of stories around that. <laughs> I I did it my way. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And uh, repeatedly. And uh, no, I think we'll dispense with music. So you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Next right. I think this discussion it leads in well to there's, there are also lots of questions about sort of the conscientious objection aspect. And so someone says, um, in Alberta, my province, there are there are Catholic facilities, Catholic healthcare facilities that won't provide MAID or even refer on MAID. And so I guess they're wondering, um, have you seen this to be a problem in Manitoba? Are you encountering many physicians that that you know refuse to be involved in this? What's been your experience on that? Well, we we certainly, um, yeah. I mean, there there have been experiences of uh, people of uh, people who have requested it, and their families have told us about times when they they didn't get information, they didn't get the person they made the request, and then they didn't feel that they were listened to, and it wasn't passed on, and and that sometimes has been you know various members of the healthcare team. Um, so that that definitely has happened. Um, we haven't had too many direct. Uh, I don't think contacts with people who are telling us that we should or shouldn't be doing things that way. But we also have certainly, yeah, in faith-based facilities, um, it's been a struggle. It's, uh, it's been, um, I think we, we really are mindful about trying to work with different organizations and respecting where people are coming from, and, uh, but at the same time respecting uh, the needs of those individuals that have, have a right to this after all, and, and how can we make it more um, uh, you know, comfortable for them and not not as uh, with as many barriers. And uh, so I think we've we've tried to work pretty much to sort of keep dialogue open and make sure people are aware. It, it has been a start. There've been a couple of situations where um, some one person was forced to go outside of an institution to have an assessment uh, on a very bad winter day in Winnipeg here, and that wasn't that wasn't great. Uh, and we didn't feel very good about that. And I think there's been more attention paid to sort of. That sort of helped change the fact that assessments can be done, and then, but but not wanting the actual assisted dying to be, happen in that facility and having another facility where people can go. But even that is fraught with difficulty because sometimes people are very precarious. They're not they're not in the you know they have their own you know both symptom control needs and and uh, to have them transferred to another facility isn't isn't that great too. So that that's that's been difficult. We have had a real couple of bad situations in, in that light, for sure. You know, I'm, I'm recalling another part of that um, when we were at a team meeting, Jill, some time ago, and you were raising the issue, let's remember how um, within a faith-based institution that is saying you can't have an assessment or as time moved on, you can have discussions and assessment visits, but you can't have an assistance. And that's still the case in some, that you cannot assist a person to die in that facility. But I think you pointed out, Jill, think how hard it is for some of the staff in those facilities to say goodbye to the patient that they've cared for and now can't complete that care. Yeah. And for some of them, that will be a personal ethical dilemma. And, and I always think about the person who has to prepare that person for a transfer to another facility. Mm -hmm. And they may not, even though they work in that facility, they may be in favor of a medically assisted death and wishing that they could have yeah. that here in their facility rather than having to transfer. It's very complicated. I'm, we're all hopeful that's over. And like I said, I would just keep the discussion open and going. And I, I think, yeah, just one more thing if you're thinking of it from an advocacy piece. I think that's the tack that our leadership has taken is to stay regularly in conversation about this. And we have seen some change um, at time and with experience. Patient care, patient. patient needs. We were initially documenting in the chart when we thought that the transfer had not been in the patient's best interest. That was a mistake because 
following up on your comment, Jill, about staff on the ground, they get that often. And so it's then another version of advocacy is to make sure that message gets to the leadership in the institution or the, the, uh, the uh, faith organization that is their um, lead of what the impact on individual patients of these institutional choices is. Mm. Right. I, f I feel like we could, I feel like we could do, I could talk to you about this for three hours. We have so, so many questions coming in. Um, I think we have time for actually just, just one more. Um, there's a, because, or, you know, I'm going to combine a few, but um, people are asking about the, about the denial process and, and follow up after that. So, you know, for instance, in a situation where there would be someone who had a mental illness only who was not eligible, you know, what kinds of supports are you finding, are you offering as follow up? Like, are, are those people suicide risks? Well, you raise one issue, and that's something that, this is not going to answer the question, but just a thought. We have to be very careful that a, a suicide threat doesn't um, have us uh, then assist someone uh, to die based solely on their threat. Um, right. Is there another way to help me to say that a bit better? So that's really about eligibility. So let me say that and then put it aside and really address your question. Well, I guess I, a lot of those early those denials that are basically based on there's no way you're eligible you're, because this is your are really dealt with with our physician, and she's very, very skilled. So what my understanding of what she's doing is connecting that individual to other resources. I mean, we may sound resource rich, but we're not really able to do you know, interventions or ongoing counseling or help ourselves, but we are connecting that individual with the people they need to be connected with. So for sure, somebody with a mental health illness. The majority of people, that, my understanding is from the, again, we, we personally, I haven't personally sort of been involved one-to-one -one with the people who have made this request with a, a mental health issue, but a majority of them have, they're already in the system, they already have the contact and and, and um, it's just kind of just to have contact with the people that they have contact with to sort of see are there things that are, are is everything being done that can be done or are there things that more need to be done? That's kind of our way of responding to it. I think the other thing to remember is if, if you think back to, um, I guess it was you, Jill, or maybe Fred talking about the triage process, that triage will involve often talking to the other healthcare providers that are involved and consulting with them about eligibility before you get into it with the patient. Right. And if we, if we well, have, sometimes we, well, sometimes we um, have people. Go ahead, Fred. Well, I just say sometimes we have people that we uh, might have mental health issues in addition to other uh, medical uh, reasons why they're required. And sometimes we're wondering whether they are really, um, are, are their mental health issues playing a role in their decision making? And so we will consult, we are very quick to consult psychiatry and have consults and have that person involved. And sometimes if those people are rejected, then we also have a built-in resource from that contact to sort of make sure that that proper follow-up is done too. Right. There is uh, seemingly endless things to discuss with this, and I know we've had a few messages coming in that are saying, like, no, please keep going. And we, we would love to if we could, but we're running out of our, our allotted time. And so um, with that, I, I just have to say that, you know, another huge thank you to, you know, the Manitoba College of Social Workers for, for connecting us with this incredible team, uh, and then especially to Jill, Fred, and Megan, you know, for sharing your expertise and your time with us today, and we, we so deeply appreciate it. Um, on, the, on the formality side, you can now access your certificate of attendance if you need it by clicking the yellow icon at the bottom. Um, and until next time, uh, you know, take care, and I, I hope we can do something again like this in the future.